All right, ready? In Augustine's City of God, he contrasts the ideal political state with the states existent in the world and concludes that a perfect state cannot exist in this world. He comes to this conclusion by comparing the love that is present in an earthly city to that of the City of God. The earthly city is self-focused and as such is lacking true justice, which Augustine defines as love serving God only. The City of God, on the other hand, is God-focused and attains true justice by turning to God to love God as its strength. If this is all that justice is, then the answer is clear. No, a perfect state is not possible. Because mankind is by nature fallen, thus not perfect. So a state comprised of mankind cannot be perfect. However, perfect and just are not always synonymous. I recognize that mankind will never know the full extent of the city of God in life. Since this is the case, we cannot compare an even theoretically achievable just society to the perfection that would come from the state of humanity removed from sin, because doing so negates the reason for this existence. The reason this question is being asked is to strive to achieve the best possible. So setting an impossible model is nonsensical. Instead, what we must do is analyze the nature of mankind and see if a just society is possible. Not a perfectly just society, but a sufficiently just society. That is, one that recognizes the limits of mankind, yet achieves the best possible, given our nature as humans. To do this, we first need to define justice. Aristotle, in the politics, defines justice as what is right, fair, or morally justifiable. This definition is patently different than the aforementioned view of Augustine, and must be considered if the question of validity of a just state is to be contemplated. In the same vein, Plato defines justice as different for the individual and different for society. For the individual, it is a virtue that makes someone self-consistent and good. For society, it is... It is a consciousness of the good. Taking these definitions, as well as the definition of Augustine, we can conclude that justice is something that is inherent in the Mago Dei, imparted by God to all of mankind, and it is not just a spontaneous in creation intended to restrict. Given this, then a just society would be one that protects the rights of its citizens and allows them the opportunity to utilize their skills to perform good. This is consistent with the findings of Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America. As he speaks about the tyranny of the majority and the desire for self-gain that those in power possess, he also praises the jury system in America, stating that it connected the citizenry with the true spirit of justice. Additionally, he recognizes the danger of complacency within a polity. If the citizens of the state become focused on their own benefits at the expense of the state, this will very quickly devolve into tyranny. Furthermore, the degradation in society that is evident from pleasure points to the focus of Augustine as he identifies this as a love of self. In this endeavor to seek pleasure, driven by self-love, the polity attempts to elevate human artifice. In doing so, they lose sight of the aim of society, to strive for the good, and the society then devolves into individualism. This chaotic degradation is only allowed when the polity that used to regulate the actions of its society is no longer involved in the discussion around its society. If this danger, as seen by Augustine and de Tocqueville, is a natural following of the polity that is not engaged in civil discussion, then the logical solution to this perversion of a state would be to constantly engage the polity. Of course, this is easier said than done, and to understand the importance of it, we must look to Aristotle and his view of habit. In Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle tackles the question of virtue and how it is achieved in society. In his assessment, he posits that virtue of character results from the ethos of society. He goes on to say that virtue is not a naturally occurring practice, but it can be acquired. In this if this virtue can be acquired, then the successful acquisition must be undertaken in an effort to achieve a sufficiently just state. To do so, we must direct the polity towards what they are naturally inclined to do. Pulling again from Aristotle, he, he claims that man is by nature a political animal. 
If we take this to be true, then the best way to engage society is to encourage public discourse. As de Tocqueville focused on, this discussion existent in society is what allows it to improve. Harping back to Aristotle again, this, encourages, this encouraged further helps the fostering of virtue because it allows the society to reach the Aristotelian mean between the two vices of excess and deficiency. The best way to facilitate this is through institutions. As shown by Adam Smith, rightly ordered institutions breed a rightly ordered populace. The antithesis of this statement can be directly seen in Plato's Apology. While it is true that the general populace was engaging with society by voting on the trial of Socrates, they were acting out of self-interest, as they were fearful of what Socrates would reveal about them if he were to live. While Socrates was attempting to reach an Aristotelian mean in society by engaging in honest discourse and pursuing virtuous and just things, the populace wanted only to preserve their own interest opting instead for a vice of excess by abusing institutional power. However, had they chosen to reprieve Socrates, they would have been acting in a way conducive to fostering virtue and order, not chaos. We can also see this vice of abusing human artifice in the first act of William Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar. As Cassius is talking to Brutus, he addresses this issue by saying that the fault is not in their stars, but in themselves. In saying this, Cassius places the interest of an ambitious politician over the interest of the polity. This again cements the idea that a just state is achievable but must be protected. Looking back to Augustine, he argues that human artifice is the downfall of the city of man. However, this does not need to be the case. In the parable of the talents, Jesus prioritizes human artifice that turns towards God as he rewarded the prudence of the two men that were wise with what they were given with control of cities. Meanwhile, the man that was not prudent is not given control of the city because his ambition would not have been aimed towards God and his human artifice would not have been aimed towards God. Additionally, in this consideration, we can look to the founding fathers. In the preamble, their intention is stated to seek justice but not perfection. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, they recognize the impossibility of attaining, of attaining perfection, so they do not seek it. Instead, they assert the statements by opting to appeal to the nature of man, a political animal. Again, while looking at the possibility of a just state, we must consider the limits of man and strive to attain the best possible. When looking at the possibility of a just state, I have to say that a perfectly just state is not achievable but a sufficiently just state, and the method in which we try to achieve it is not only possible, but necessary. Thank you, Bonhoeffer. Next, we're going to have the House of C.S. Lewis and then the House of S.B.A. So please help me welcome the House of C.S. Lewis. I'm allowed to use my phone as a timer, right? Nope. Just as long as I'm not. I, I have to follow the rules this year. Yeah. It's good to see you all here today. As I'll mentioned, I will not be taking the mic out of the stand because some of you who are um, interregnum prepared lecture aficionados may know me as the person who walked all around the stage last year holding the mic in my hands and apparently it sounded too much like a motivational speech or something. So now there are direct stipulations in the prepared lecture prompt that you have to stay behind the podium. I thought about picking up the podium and carrying it around. I decided not to do that. Um, or and that it cannot be a motivational speech, so I will try to demotivate you as much as possible. <laughs> So I actually, I want to begin talking about this, this idea of justice and order and individualism um, by telling a little bit of a story of an experience I had yesterday. I, um, I teach study skills for a living, so I go to classes all over 
New York City, and in order to have food, I have to talk to groups of students who are in middle school and high school, and it's sometimes amazing and sometimes miserable. Yesterday, it was miserable because I had a particularly rough class. Um, despite constant attempts at crowd control, it was a group that just wouldn't stop talking. If you've ever been in a classroom, you know what this is like. It's like you go over to one group and you tell them, hey, please stop talking. You get them quiet and then another group immediately begins to speak, right? And so you have to go over there. And by the time you get that group to stop talking, you have to go back and correct the first group again, right? And so there are all these tables of talking children. I was annoyed. The teacher was annoyed. We weren't having it, right? There's this one particularly bad group of girls. Um, there, there was a group of five girls at a, at a, at a corner, a back table corner. And whenever they thought I wasn't looking, they would stand up and begin to do a prepared dance. Like, they all knew the same dance. It, it was sort of like a combination of the Macarena and, and like a really bad middle school musical. So they're like standing there and they do this and they dance and it started out with one and then two more would join in and three more. Soon all five of them were all dancing at the same time in this back corner. And I turned to them and I'd say, hey, please stop that. I'm, I'm trying to teach this amazing, important study skill. Um, and whenever I would turn away to talk to another group, that's, they would go back to the very exciting dance. At one point, all five of them stood up at the same time and began to dance. And that was when I had it. I, was, I looked at them and I said, you all are being disrespectful. This is unacceptable. We really need to get back to the class. Um, they didn't. And so the teacher decided at that point he had to throw them out. Um, I bring this story up because I think nothing better demonstrates like the, the intrinsic human tendency to pursue rampant individualism in the face of the established order, right? Even a group of sixth graders has an inbuilt drive to buck the system, to rebel, right? For the sake of their own selfish gain and entertainment. So we're dealing with a really big problem here. Um, but before we talk about individualism, I actually think we should talk about what justice is, right? Because that's, that's part of what this is. How do we establish justice in the face of this problem of rampant individualism that seems to be an inbuilt human trait, right? It's, it's pretty clear that justice is a type of order. Um, there's a long tradition stretching back to Plato that affirms this, right? But we're not just talking about law and order here, like a neocon might like, right? We're going to be tough on crime, and we're going to make sure that people don't mess up, right? It's not, it's not just about like establishing good laws and having a good police force, right? It's actually a just society, ultimately, is one which models the created order of God's rule over his creation. Um, according to Augustine, the earthly city itself is ruled by a lust of rule. This is the era of the Tower of Babel. He, he ties it to that. It places human artifice above God's created order. So the, the notion of God's rule over his creation is crucial to our idea of justice in a society. Because our stance towards God is going to determine our capacity towards, us to, or, or towards order and justice. Um, those who submit to the created order, we've... When we submit to the creator order, we find ourselves in flourishing com political community. When we don't, we throw the political realm into chaos. Unfortunately, that's the basic state of human beings, like we established a moment ago. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America details the political consequences of the character problem of individualism. He says, egoism is a passionate and exaggerated love of self, which leads a man to connect everything with his own person and to prefer himself to everything in the world. Individualism is a calm and mature feeling, which disposes each member of the community to sever itself from the mass of its fellow creatures. Now, when we hear that, we might say, oh, so egoism is bad, individualism, maybe that can be okay. Um, but the problem is, individualism at first, as he, he continues, he says, individualism at first only saps the virtues of public life, but in the long run, it attacks and destroys all others, and at length is observed in downright egoism. So de Tocqueville's building this chain, he says, we're, we're all sort of individualistic by nature, especially in a democratic community. And once we, once we start pursuing that individualism, we take that far enough, and it's, a, it's automatic consequence is going to be egoism. And what's the problem with egoism? We gotta go, well, maybe people are just focused on themselves. That's okay in politics. Well, it's not okay. It has direct consequences for the political order. Because no vice of the human heart, this is a great quote from de Tocqueville, no vice of the human heart is so acceptable to despotism as egotism. A despot easily forgives his subjects for not loving him, provided they don't love each other. So the idea is, we're, we're individualistic, we're just looking out for ourselves, maybe our families, right? But then we go from there, and suddenly it becomes a, a love of self, right? An inordinate self-love, to, to use Augustinian, Augustinian terms, right? Um, and from that inordinate love of self, it provides opportunities for tyranny, 
or for anarchy, depending on which way we lean, whether we're whether the individuals decide to rise up and overthrow the state or somebody comes in control of the state and decides to control the individuals. So de Tocqueville gives two great solutions, right? He says two options are free institutions like the church, communities like this that draw people together, that make them love one another. That's great. And he says another solution is incentivizing people to pursue virtue, basically to, con to convince people that looking out for other people is actually beneficial to themselves, right? It's sort of like the golden rule, do to others as you'd have them do to you, right? If I do good for those people, they're gonna do back for me, our whole community is going to be better. Now, those are two great solutions on the political, the political front, right? They, they might help mitigate some of the, the chaotic dangers of individualism. But as we established before, this isn't just a political problem. It's not just something that only appears in democracies. It's not just something that only appears under circum cer certain circumstances. It's part of what we are. Um, so we need, a, we need a solution that's more, I think, theological, philosophical. And this is where Augustine comes in. He, he has a great quote. He says, as this divine master inculcates two precepts, the love of God and the love of our neighbor. So this is already automatically opposed to individualism. He says, and in these precepts, a man finds three things he has to love, God, himself, and his neighbor. And that he who loves God loves himself, since thereby it follows that he must, he must endeavor to get his neighbor to love God, since he is ordered to love his neighbor as himself. He, must, he ought to make this endeavor in behalf of his wife, his children, his household, all within reach even as he would wish his neighbor to do the same for him if he needed it. And consequently, he will be at peace, or in well-ordered concord, with all men, as far as in him lies. So what Augustine is saying is, it's not good enough to just like look around and say, yeah, I, I can help out my neighbors. It's actually, we have to have well-ordered love. That's his whole thing, right? He says, yeah, you, should, you, have a, you have an obligation to love yourself, right? But you also have an obligation to love your neighbor. And not just in a way that helps yourself out, but genuinely for their benefit, right? And then he also says, and you have an obligation to love God. He says, people should pursue these principles, and when a ruler pursues these principles, he will rule not from a love of power, but from a sense of duty that they owe to others. Not because they're proud of authority, but because they love mercy, right? Even a ruler who's pursuing, who, who's pursuing like this like sort of pseudo love for others, right, it's all ultimately going to come back to his own power. But if he has a genuine love for God and a genuine love for other people, he's going to be ruling out of mercy. But I think there's one more caveat we need to make here. Um, and Augustine makes this, and it's, it's, it's important, it's a little bit sobering. He says, even this trusting in God's help, even trusting that we can love him and love others, cannot be accomplished without his help. Right? We're not actually going to be able to pursue this order of, of political community without God's grace. As our, the esteemed Ben White said the other day, uh, God can transform our order into chaos, right? Ultimately, this comes down to God's ability to, to intervene in our lives um, with grace. So, is a just state possible? It's, yes, but it's only going to be ultimately possible through the grace of God. If we think about returning to the level of the individual for a second, God gives people the ability to look out for their friends and neighbors. He gives people the ability to love him and to love others. And he enables rulers to rule for mercy rather than for power. Which, what's great about that is once individuals start to love God and love each other, then those other political situa or other political solutions can, be, can come into play, right? Where we're having churches and when we're having, um, and, 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 uh, and uh, just to care for the people around us. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Next year, there will be a rule against editorializing about the rules. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, um, we'll I hope there are points being taken off in the engagement section since the first 30 seconds was not about the prompt. <laughs> um, next up, we have the House of SBA. And House, of, House of Ten Boom, you should be prepared to go next. You're on deck. Um, by the way, Mike and I work together and we love each other. You did a great job, so give it up for Lewis. <laughs> of petty and paltry pleasures, a lust for domination and a tendency toward individualism. 
In light of this corruption, is the political project doomed from the start? Tocqueville warns about the pervasive presence of individualism and the isolation that results when men of equality join together in political community. Men come to exist for themselves alone. Though physically they join together in a political arena, they are interested only in their own well-being. This atomism is the root of despotism. Similarly, Augustine wrote in The City of God that the earthly city was created by self-love reaching to the point of contempt of God. And he feared the presence of this lust for domination. Humans do not love what they ought to love. We seek to rule over our fellow men, to satiate our own lust for power. Augustine warns against disordered loves and man's inability to reorder his own soul. He believed that true justice has no existence save in the Republic whose founder and ruler is Christ. And of course, where on earth do we witness such a regime? Pure justice exists only in the city of God. Both Tocqueville and Augustine feared the political community seek individual gain and power above righteousness and truth. If despotism and tyranny are the inevitable results of man's individuality and lust for power, then, this, then the city of God, democracy in America, and the King's College would be fruitless projects. Why bother to write a book to tell us that we are doomed from the start? Why pursue a public life of the spirit when, we are, when the regime is destined for failure? The fear of the impossibility of justice cannot be the entire story. A just state is one in which both statesmen and citizens are not harmed by despots or tyrants, but rather seek to bring earthly order, first by loving God and then by ruling all else well. While a perfectly just regime is not attainable given the sinful nature of man, the pursuit of a just state is not fruitless. We can stand tend closer to justice than injustice reaching for the city of God even as we reside in the city of man, moving closer to order even though some chaos is inevitable. This world is fallen, but redeemable. As we pursue the ordering of our souls and our cities and draw closer to the origin of all order, the word that became flesh. Both Tocqueville and Augustine understand this. They perceive that men naturally possess an ambition that cares for the pleasures of the present moment alone, seeking their own reputation, property, and power. However, this fact drives neither to despair. Both understand that ambition is not inherently evil. It is only dangerous when misdirected. They propose remedies that direct personal ambition toward the common good. A man's drive for power can lead him to political life, and the political theater gives him opportunities to better the lives of his fellow men. Alexander Hamilton designed the office of the president to attract men with great ambition for leadership, but placed constitutional barriers preventing them from unlimited power. Tocqueville likewise understands that ambition must not be extinguished, it must be given a new telos. Good political community must purify and regulate man's ambition without impoverishing it beyond measure. Good political communities are possible. It, even Augustine, who despaired over the impossibility of a perfectly just state, did not believe earthly governments to be inherently evil. He instead thought that their pursuit of earthly peace was a good thing. The danger lies in neglecting the better things, so the heavenly city, while in pursuit of earthly order. The ordering of the desires of statesmen and citizens determines the potential for goodness in a regime. While men might naturally desire reputation, property, and power, the dangerous tendencies of those desires can be ameliorated when properly directed. The natural ambitions of man, when placed below a desire to serve God and fellow men, can be good. Man's loves will never be in perfect order, but they can be closer to order than to chaos. For Tocqueville, the mere fact that we can acknowledge the risks of slipping into despotism help us to guard against these dangerous tendencies. Immediately following his warnings against despotism, he makes very clear, I wanted to put forth in full light the risks. 
I believe firmly that these risks are most formidable as well as the least foreseen, but I do not believe them to be insurmountable. Both Tocqueville and Augustine explicitly state that society needs religion to properly order our desires and therefore avoid despotism and tyranny. Religion counteracts man's selfish tendencies by placing the object and desires of men above and beyond the good things of earth and imposing on each man some duties toward the human species. Thus, religious people are naturally strong precisely in the places where democratic people are naturally weak. And Tocqueville's estimation, any religion is good to combat man's weakness, but Christianity is especially helpful. Christianity causes men to forget himself while working with fervor toward the prosperity of all. Likewise, Augustine argues that through God's divine grace and interference, men are no longer constrained to act upon their lusts, but converted from their evil desires. It is the direction of Christ that allows man to pursue true peace and justice, even amidst the presence of sin. Man's inability to achieve perfect justice is an indisputable reality. But we can have a better state rather than a worse one. We can have ambition that is subdued and properly directed. We can create a political system that guards against tyrants, a regime vigilant against despotism, where men work together to order their souls. It's not doomed to permanent injustice and chaos. Tocqueville urges us, let us have for the future this salutary fear that makes us vigilant and combative, and not this sort of soft and idle terror that weakens and enervates hearts. The entire project of the Federalist was to prove just this that a regime tending towards justice is possible. James Madis Madison in, uh, writes in Federalist 55, were the pictures which we have drawn faithful likeness of the human character, the inference would be that there is not sufficient virtue among men for self-government, and that nothing less than the chains of despotism can restrain them from destroying and devouring one another. Madison believes that as there is a degree of depravity in mankind which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust, so there are other qualities in human nature which justify a certain portion of esteem and confidence. It is these qualities deserving of esteem and confidence, the ability to seek the good, to order your soul, to constrain your ambition, make the pursuit of justice possible and fruitful. G.K. Chesterton says that if a thing is worth doing, it is worth doing badly. This does not mean that we should half-heartedly pursue a just regime. Rather, Chesterton thinks that effort, not success, is primary. Efforts come from the soul while results are often determined by outside circumstances. He affirms the goodness of the pursuit, even absent the goodness of the results. This is how we must pursue a just state. If despotism is inevitable, we might as well go hide in the basement, throw away our copies of democracy in, the, in America, probably drop out of kings, and pray for the imminent arrival of the city of God. Augustine observed the disordered souls of mankind and lamented there is no true justice to be found in the city of man. But Tocqueville concludes his analysis by saying he is full of both fear and hope. He was fearful of the tendencies toward individualism and tyrannical power, those deserving circumspection and distrust that are deeply rooted in the heart of every man. He was fearful that the American experiment would result in barbarism, misery, and despotism. He feared that the pursuit of justice would be abandoned in light of its unachievable final goal. But he was also hopeful for the work to be done. I too am hopeful. In seeking justice in the political sphere, let us not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Perfect justice is not attainable, but total injustice is not inevitable. We can guard against tyranny and create safeguards for ambition. We are not doomed to, good, to chaos. There is goodness in the pursuit of the good. 
The attempt to secure ourselves against despotism by ordering our souls is neither worthless nor futile, but rather it is our best guard against earthly injustice. We will only see perfect justice when the city of God comes to fruition. Until then, let us work diligently. House of SBA, House of Tenbu, it is your time, and then House of Thatcher is going to be rounding out the batting order after. Please help me welcome House of Tenbu. riddled with stories of men who act selfishly, primarily considering their individual gain and abusing the power they have, whether it be power given to them through those in their care, or power that they have usurped through force of others. But even despite the actuality and potentiality for abuse of the city with a man, humanity has also the potential to realize the transcendent perspective of the heavenly city. Humanity has the opportunity to experience the witness the union, and the love, and the outpouring of justice in political communities here on earth. Yet, this only comes through true understanding. Unfortunately, man is prone to pursue base things based on their natural state, insofar as it is possible to understand the already of the reality or the future of the heavenly city, and the not yet of the present city of man. It is possible to have a just state. However, in political communities where personal power and individual gain is prevalent, this just state is unattainable. Before understanding what justice or just society is, we first must address what human nature is like. According to Federalist number 51, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. While perfect government or just society is a fair goal, it is an unattainable fantasy because men are fallen. A community cannot properly cohere if selfish goals are prevalent and even uplifted. What does justice look like in political context? Paramount to answering this question is defining what a just society is, using the wisdom of those who have come before us. In Plato's Republic, Glaucon struggles to define justice. Plato defines justice as to do one's own business and not to be a busybody. While this may sound as if Plato is promoting individualism, He's actually saying that each citizen of each society must do one's own work in order to allow society to function and thrive. Plato continues his argument by defining what a citizen is, someone who stands by his or her own country, not abandoning his country, even when it does wrong. Of course, the citizen must act within reason when, when um, using his loyalty to his country. Plato eventually defines the common view of justice as speaking truth and giving back what one takes or is owed. This definition leads to complications because there are multiple types of justice. There's justice legal and justice fitting. Justice legal is the political view of justice. It is practically required and has moral limitation. Justice fitting, however, is the philosophic view of justice. It cannot be put into practice, but you can't understand it and have the ultimate goal in mind. <coughs> this is challenging with Plato's definition because are citizens supposed to give back with what is owed morally or owed legally? What is legal isn't always legal, and vice versa. Ultimately, politics needs people who will stand by their people because they are theirs. If unity is the utmost goal and purpose of a just society, then a society based on individualism should not be encouraged. We learn from Tocqueville that while democracy is successful and um, used in America, France and other nations should not copy it. Instead of fostering intellectual ideas, democracy promotes selfishness and materialism because it is a system that prefers simplicity and directness. <coughs> the consequence of this is people pursuing economic interests and material desires rather than unity and what is best for the common good. In fact, the emphasis on equality and individualism dissolves the bonds of society. The only way individualism can be helpful, according to Tocqueville, is through his doctrine of interest, well understood. In Democracy of America, Tocqueville it finds that if the individual advantage of citizens would not be to work toward the happiness of all, 
and when they have discovered one of these points where particular interests meet with general interests and merges with it, they hasten to bring it to light. He found that you can harness man's inherent selfishness to promote the good of all. Individual men will want to achieve the common goal because of their selfish desires, knowing that it will in turn benefit themselves. Further, an individualistic society can never be considered a just society because as humans we are fallen. <coughs> This leads to prioritizing individualism above anything else, instead of finding a way to weave it together with the promotion of the common good. Life in community requires self-sacrifice for the sake of the community. 1 Corinthians 12, 15 through 16 says, Now the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. In Christ, we find unity and belonging. If the body of Christ is the community, and every city requires unity to make it just, then pursuing individual endeavors simply cannot result in a just society. Furthermore, in 1 Corinthians 12, 25 through 26, we are told, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices. If the body is disjointed, then the people are not focused on promoting a unified state. The heart of the problem comes from man trying to assert his independence from community and from God, which is ultimately what sin is. Additionally, in order to promote a just state, if, in order to decide if a just state is possible, you must look at what the purpose is. Tell us is the purpose or end goal. Do humans have a purpose? And if there is a purpose that's not followed, are there consequences? We also have to take into consideration moral ecology. You can't make people moral, but you can promote moral behavior or a moral environment to pursue a more just state. A society focused solely on oneself is only going to produce an egocentric society that will ultimately fail and burn. However, a society with leaders who encourage working together and working towards that unified goal of the good of the whole people can potentially achieve the outcome of a just society. Justice is also not attainable in cities promoting power and individualism because there's always someone in greater power making the decisions, controlling the people, or prioritizing the power above everything else. In Democracy in America, Tocqueville says he exists only in himself and for himself alone, and if his kindred still remain to him, he may be said at any rate to have lost his country. If the citizens are only functioning to promote themselves, then they might as well not be part of society anymore as they have already lost their country. In Democracy in America, Tocqueville finds an immense and unchecked power which allowed them to gratify their whimsical tastes and to employ for that purpose the whole strength of the state. When too much power is present, the ruling becomes tyrannical and individuals use their power simply for personal gain. This emphasis on the self rather than the whole community hinders the ability for a just society. In the city of God, Augustine says, the one city loves its own strength, shown in its powerful leaders. The other says to its God, I will love you, my Lord, my strength. This is an example of Augustine's two cities, the city of man and the city of God. It is possible to live in either city, but you're in either one depending on how you're living. People in the city of man live their lives promoting themselves and their individual interests while people living in the city of God, you're choosing to devote yourself and your actions to unity within the body of Christ, in turn promoting the good of the whole society, which, we can, which can, re, which can um, result in a just society. Ultimately, it is our purpose to pursue the heavenly city. We can do so by aiming to be a unified polis, striving for the good of the whole rather than the good of the individual. If the state is our ideal form of government, but we cannot achieve it, then what is the point? To rehearse for the day when we will live in the heavenly city, knowing that insofar as our earthly city reflects the knowledge of our citizenship to the heavenly one, it will be more aligned with the way things are supposed to be. Thank you, Tim Boo. And finally, we have the house of Margaret Thatcher. And after Thatcher is finished, um, make sure that you find your liaison to check in and get that sweet, sweet internet credit. That's <laughs> Thatcher. Yeah, you're up.
the judges are ready. America is not a democracy. This is not my thesis. This is the title of a 2018 article from The Atlantic about a small town political issue in Oxford, Massachusetts. In this article, the author explains how a years long bipartisan community effort to end the monopolistic regime of the water supply company Aquarian was thwarted when lobbyists for the company pulled the fire alarm in the local high school auditorium where the buyout was being voted on. Of course, this created outrage among the community. The government taking power out of the hands of the people again. This is America's main problem. Or is it? In 2011, The Economist published an article about the woes of the California budget and how even though we often blame legislators and the governor, the real culprit was direct democracy. Citizens being able to fire elected officials, reject legislation, and form copious initiatives to create regulation. This article was opposingly titled, The Perils of Direct Democracy in America. On one end of the country in Massachusetts, the power-hungry leaders impede justice. On the other side of the country in California, the excessive individualism and subjective freedom impedes justice. The question before us today is this. In a hyper-individualistic society, combined with the prioritization of power, is a just state possible? Well, as the preacher in Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, what has been will be again. There is nothing new under the sun. This question, along with many others, was posed nearly 200 years ago by Alexis de Tocqueville in his two-volume book, Democracy in America, after traveling to America from France and experiencing her democracy for the first time. In the excerpt of this book provided in the prompt, we certainly see the darker corner of de Tocqueville's views on individualism. This view is not unsubstantiated, and it even goes deeper than the perils of direct democracy described in the Economist article. To de Tocqueville, justice was being thwarted by individualism in America through more than just popular government. Individualism was creating, an, dis, creating a disinterest in one's community and an unhealthy emphasis on selfish ambition. Tocqueville worries that, quote, each of them, living apart, is a stranger to the fate of all the rest. His children and his private friends constitute to him the whole of mankind. As for the rest of mankind, he is close to them, but he does not see them. He touches them, but he does not feel them. Similarly, in the excerpt from Augustine, City of God, Augustine warns against the excessive self-love, lust for dominion, trust in our, and trust in our own strength that sometimes seems to characterize the ambitious American spirit. We live in a world entangled between the city of God, the one pointed towards the heavenly kingdom, and the city of man. However, it is often a temptation for those in the former, when focusing on family and church and personal life, to forget about the plight of those in the latter. <clears throat> Nowhere are these convincing critiques of individualism truer in our society today than in the criminal justice system. Once again, there is nothing new under the sun. De Tocqueville raised questions about this, as well as after his travels to America stating his shock at the wide disparity between those that are helped and protected by popular government and those that are discarded by it. Of the prisons, Tocqueville says, quote, society in the United States gives the most extended liberty. The prisons in the same country offer the spectacle of the most complete despotism. Unfortunately, this trend has only persisted and possibly worsened in America over the past 200 years. Having narrowed our social circles in the name of individualism, we give ourselves a pass to ignore the more than two million incarcerated prisoners in our country. John Pfaff, who is a professor of law at Fordham University and the author of Locked In, The True Causes of Mass Incarceration and How to Achieve Real Reform, writes about the broken politics of punishment in his book. The brokenness results from this age-old division between individualism, power in the hands of the people, and despotism. Too much, power in the hand, too much power in the hands of those in charge. Localism, Path says, quote, would help ensure prosecutors were selected by people who directly experienced both the gains from enforcement and its cost. His fear, however, is much like Tocqueville's. Quote, many of the problems with criminal justice come from an indifference to the cost, and that indifference is bred by distance. Sadly, for most Americans, that distance in physical miles is actually a lot smaller than they will ever realize. But for widespread justice to occur, 
Entire communities of people are required to go out of their way to know the stories of those behind bars, which seems like a lot to ask, considering that, according to the Pew Research Center, one third of Americans don't even know their neighbors' names. With all of that being said, and to Tocqueville's criticism of individualism being stated, it would be a mischaracterization of his work to say that he felt individualism would be the downfall of democracy, or even to say that he disliked it as a whole. In fact, he felt that the individualism in democracy is the inevitable result of intellects becoming equal and enlightenment spreading. The same can be said for his belief about powerful leaders. He writes in his introduction that, quote, it is not the use of power or the habit of obedience that depraves men. It is the use of a power that they consider as illegitimate and obedience to a power that they regard as usurped and oppressive. The good people in a democracy have the ability to step into these positions of power and guard against oppression. This is what de Tocqueville celebrates. Somehow, though not perfectly, the subjective freedom of the people balances out the power of the the balances out the power hungry. Tocqueville is an example of someone constantly living in the tension between the city of man and the city of God that Augustine talks about. He sees the potential of the fallen world to be good and just, but also sees that down every path there are dark corners. The difficult task for those in the city of God is to recognize that as James K.A. Smith put it in his book, Desiring the Kingdom, we are embodied feelers that all love something and we must appreciate each person's individual loves and desires while also seeking out common goals for all of us, citizens of man and citizens of the city of man and the city of God alike to aim at. Needless to say, this is an enormous task and explains in itself why perfect justice cannot be achieved on earth. It requires a common definition of the good life, and those that believe in a heavenly kingdom should have a significantly different picture of what the good life is. So, is a just state possible with a pervasive presence of power-hungry, hyper-individualistic people? Well, yes and no. The possibility of a just state is out there, and all in the city of God are, or should be, tirelessly working towards its actualization. It will, be not, it will not be fully realized on this side of heaven. So what is our incentive to seek it on earth? What's the point of finding, finding the ever tipping balance between good power and bad power, good individualism and bad individualism? Well, there's the fact that a good bit of the Bible is centered around humanity bearing the image of God as his ambassadors here on earth. But other than that, we don't really have the full answer to that question. Tocqueville asked this question too nearly 200 years ago when he writes in, it, in his introduction, quote, will I think that the creator made man in order to leave him to struggle endlessly? This sounds similar to the repeated laments of the preacher in Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, he writes, all is vanity. Everything under the sun, he says, is vapor, a mist, a breath in the wind, meaningless. That is, unless there is more than what is under the sun. Unless this kingdom that Augustine speaks of, or the kingdom that Tocqueville saw glimpses of when he came to America is real. In that case, we still won't have the full answer as to why we strive, sometimes seemingly without reward. Tocqueville writes of God's plans, quote, I do not know them, but I will not cease to believe in them because I cannot fathom them, and I will prefer to doubt my knowledge than his justice. If we know that there's a kingdom, we know as the preacher calls it, quote, the end of the matter, that all has been heard. We know to fear God and to keep his commandments, and that that is our whole duty. While we pursue imperfect justice now, we wait for what the preacher speaks of in the last sentence of Ecclesiastes, the time when, quote, God will bring every, bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Thank you.